For three decades, the secret to the identity of Britain's most notorious criminal hoaxer lay forgotten in a dusty storage cage. Peter Sutcliffe was the real Yorkshire Ripper. For five years, he terrorized the north of England, killing 13 women and attacking at least eight others. But Britain's biggest ever murder investigation was sabotaged by hoax letters and a tape claiming to be from the killer. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. I want While you police searched for the hoaxer, Sutcliffe carried on killing for over two years. The hoaxer was never caught until 21st century detectives began searching for the evidence that would finally identify him. A tiny scrap of paper was the key to bringing to justice the Yorkshire Ripper hoaxer. I'm Jack. We're in the interview room at Wood Street Police Station at Wakefield. John, this is your opportunity to tell your version of events and your side of the story. What can you tell me about it, John? This is the moment petty criminal John Humble admitted to being the Yorkshire Ripper hoaxer. Oh, I did send it. Just repeat that for me, what did you say? I did send the letter. Tell me all about it, John. Later on, in June, I sent the tape. It's got my voice on. It was the first time Humble had told anyone the voice that had terrified the nation was his. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. At that time, we believed that that was the killer of my mother. Um, so it was awful to hear, really. You are no near catching me now. I know Sutcliffe did the murders, but I think he aided him doing it. Helped him along. I warned you in March that I'd strike again. I thought it was a, a very wicked thing Sorry, to do. It wasn't Bradford. Some wouldn't have died if... Good, I couldn't get there. If he hadn't done that, I think it's possible that Sutcliffe would have been caught sooner. In 1979, the north of England lived in fear of a serial killer who seemed untouchable. All his victims were attacked with a hammer and then stabbed. The frenzied nature of the assaults led to the nickname the Yorkshire Ripper. By spring of that year, he'd already killed 10 women in West Yorkshire and Manchester. Any woman out alone after dark is at risk. It, it just took over people's lives, literally, it did. People eat, eat sleep, and breathe in the Yorkshire Ripper, thinking, am I going to be next? Not if it's going to happen to me, when's it going to happen to me? Not every woman he attacked died. One of his first victims was a girl of 14, attacked in a village called Silsden near Bradford. She was approached by Sutcliffe and chatted to him as she walked home after playing with friends. It's like it happened yesterday. I just went to turn around and just uh, thank him for his company. And next thing I knew, he was pitting me five times on the head. It knocked me down. A car came down, disturbed him, and it threw me over this fence here. And I remember him running off. I can actually hear it now, running off. And uh, I just clambered around the fields um, just to try to get somewhere where I'd be safe. Tracy Brown helped police draw up a photo fit of the man who attacked her. The resemblance to the Yorkshire Ripper is remarkable. Dark curly hair like a style hair. With a very dark full beard and a moustache. Very dark eyes. That was my identikit picture. It wasn't perfection, but 
It was, it was nearly damaged. The Ripper's trail of murder and assault sparked the biggest manhunt in British criminal history. Over the next six years, it stretched the police to breaking point. There were thousands of potential suspects. But in the spring of 79, one stood out. The author of a sinister series of letters to police and the Daily Mirror. Generally speaking, the attitude was that if it was not the Ripper who had written them, the writer knew something about it, and uh, he had to be eliminated, he had to, to be found. The letters contained detailed information about the Ripper attacks, and even predicted where he'd strike next. The writer called himself Jack the Ripper. The letters were posted in Sunderland and addressed personally to Assistant Chief Constable George Oldfield, the man in charge of the manhunt. Detective Inspector David Zacherson was among a team of officers in Northumbria asked to find the writer. But it was all fairly low, low key at that stage. Mr. Oldfield was extremely qualified in what he said. He didn't say the killer resides in Sunderland, the killer is from the northeast. What he did say, to the best of my recollection, that he might have some connection. The letters were posted in Sunderland, but there was nothing in them to suggest the writer came from there. But his next contact left no doubt. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. Good Lord. Among the bags of mail that arrived daily at the incident room was a cassette tape. On it was a personal message for George Oldfield. I reckon your boys are letting you down, George. You can't be much good, can you? The voice had an unmistakably Geordie accent. It changed the whole focus of the investigation. Yours, Chuck the Ripper. Thirty years later, police finally came face to face with the man behind the voice. Oh, it was eerie, really like, wasn't it? It is, isn't it? Must have been mad. Why do you say that? I feel crap. Why do you feel crap? Right, for putting the coppers off. You know where? George Oldfield's closest confidant was his deputy, Detective Chief Superintendent Dick Holland. You never learn, do they, George? I thought he was taunting George in particular and the, the inquiry staff in general uh, that we were getting nowhere and wasting our time. And from my point of view, I was more determined to get him. Two months before the tape had arrived, a bank clerk, Josephine Whitaker, had become the Ripper's tenth victim. She was murdered on playing fields in Halifax. There'd been no arrests and few significant clues. The police were getting nowhere. Could the tape be the breakthrough they desperately needed? George Oldfield consulted all the senior detectives on the investigation. Among them was Detective Chief Superintendent John DeMail. He talked to me about going public with the letters and tapes because those things would be positive, they would be easy for teams to deal with, and it would take the inquiry positively forward. George Oldfield was deeply, deeply involved in the investigation. This series of deaths and attacks had really got to him, and he was as determined as anyone that I've ever met to get to the successful conclusion of the inquiry. The voice was far easier to project and far more likely to be identified than say, well, here's a few lines of, uh, uh, of handwriting. See if you can identify that. Well, I keep on going for quite a while yet. There was enough in the letters and tape to convince Oldfield that they were from the killer. I can't see himself. Now he decided to let the public hear the voice with the Geordie accent. He left them in no doubt. 
This was the voice of the Yorkshire Ripper. It was literally a worldwide news conference. Now, what I actually remember about it is uh, George Oldfield, uh, he was not quite au fait with modern technology and he couldn't press the right button to start it playing. <laughs> I leaned over from the back uh, and started it. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look cutting me. I remember listening to that tape and thinking, by heavens, this sounds every bit like a murderer. It can't be much good, can you? There's a certain menace in his voice. I can read I'm going. I should be in the book of records. I think it's 11 up the now, isn't it? Many people were sitting on the edge of their seats. They were desperately trying to take down in shorthand what the man was saying. The only time they came near touching me was a few months back in Chapel Town. I looked at George Oldfield, slightly bent over the tape. He had obviously listened to it again and again and again. It was quite obvious that he was hoping that this would bring about a very quick solution. Uh, but we've narrowed the field now to uh, an area where we know he was born, brought up, lived during his formative years, and that's the uh, Sunderland area of the northeast. He clearly sees it as a personal tussle between himself, uh, himself and you. How do you see it? Just the same. I have the greatest respect for you. I have the greatest respect for you. Good Lord. Good Lord. Did he have a respect for George Overfield? No, I said that on the tape, didn't I? I did have respect for him. I felt sorry for him anyway. Because he, they, they, his coppers and mates were letting him down, and he was turning out older by the day. So I thought I was doing him a favour, letting the coppers look harder. And they did, they caught him. But far from doing George Oldfield a favour, John Humble redirected the entire course of the investigation to the wrong part of the country. As the tape was played across the nation back in 1979, listening were Richard and Sonia McCann. This is undoubtedly the best lead the detectives have had since the Ripper first killed four years ago. They believed they were hearing the voice of the man who murdered their mother. Police say someone somewhere must know this voice. I'm not quite sure when I strike again. Maybe September, October. I still associate that voice oh, with Peter, Peter Sutcliffe. Sutcliffe. Because we've never really been shown Peter Sutcliffe's voice, when I heard it just then, I, I imagine Peter Sutcliffe speaking those words. Wilma McCann was the Ripper's first murder victim. She was killed on October the 30th, 1975. Richard and Sonia were aged six and seven when their mum failed to come back from a night out. She was killed in a playing field just yards from her home. I can't see myself being nicked just yet. We, we um, listened for that voice, every, every man that spoke. We listened for that voice. I mean, before the voice, we were just looking for men that we thought might, you know, show a sign of being mum's killer. We were, we were listening out for it. You know, you were looking for people with a Geordie accent, or listening out and thinking that you're going to come across Mum's killer. You are no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. I reckon your boys are letting you down, George. And there's part of the message where he actually, you know, it refers to when he started four years ago. He's talking about our mother mm. four years ago. He could and really sound like a murderer. He did, well, he did sound, sound like, like a murderer. murderer. It was frightening, the voice. If you think back, that voice was frightening. Because we believed it was the, the murderer. Well, we believed it at the time. I did, at the time. so did everybody else. Well, not everybody. <laughs> the police investigation switched its focus to men from Sunderland. Everyone was told to listen to the voice of the Ripper. The police called in voice experts to narrow down further where the voice was from. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. The only time they came near touching me 
Was a few months back in town. We started off at the at Weirmouth and visited pubs and clubs mm. and various places and talked to people, played them. I took a, an Uwe machine with the voice on and played to people the, the voice and asked them what they thought about it. I've come here tonight to play you a tape of the man who we believe to be the so-called Yorkshire Ripper. And I met somebody then in Castletown and I thought, my gosh, that's the same voice. It had all the similar features that I was accustomed to hearing from, from the tape. Mm -hmm. And so I pinpointed Castletown as the place where I believed the hoaxer, in fact, was probably born and brought up and lived the majority of his life, learning how to talk from his neighbours. Castletown is a tiny village on the outskirts of Sunderland. In 1979, every man from there was a suspect. And we heard it many, many times. People were saying, could it be him? Could it be him? Could it be him? And innocent people were getting named as being the suspect. And the thing is, even though we heard it a thousand times, none of us recognised the voice. You just sort of automatically sit down and rack your brains to find out this voice. And I sat and sat and listened to it and listened to it and it didn't remind me of anybody. You know, I told the detectives come to say me about Jack the Ripper. You know, you get things that gun through your mind, you know. The man they were looking for somehow slipped through the net. I when uh, the, the coppers were raking all over the castle down. They all live on the other side of the river. Did they knock on your door, John? No, I didn't get anywhere near me. You were never seen throughout no, the inquiry when they spent all that time no, in Sunderland? Not once. How old were you? I couldn't believe it. Pardon? I couldn't believe it. Why couldn't you believe I was, it? I, was, I didn't, didn't, because they were checking him. They checked the bloke next door, Ernie. One woman who'd survived an attack by the Ripper couldn't believe the police were searching in Sunderland at all. Crucially, Tracy Brown had heard him speak. I know I was only 14, but I do know the distance between a Geordie accent and a Yorkshire accent. There was no comparison. Um, I just knew myself deep down it wasn't him, because he, um, he was definitely a Yorkshire man, because, you know, I walked up with a guy for 30, for 30 minutes and I know what he sounded like. Um, and I just knew there was no doubt in my mind that the police had got this one wrong. And it was frustrating because I knew it happened to me and I just thought that they weren't taking any notice of the identical picture which I had made as well. I just thought that I'd just been found to the back of a filing cabinet just gathering dust. Although Tracy's photo fit was almost identical to Peter Sutcliffe, police ignored her account because they didn't believe the man who attacked her was the Ripper. As John Humble's hoax distracted the police, the real Ripper was able to carry on undisturbed. Just finishing her second year at Bradford University was Beryl Leach's daughter, Barbara. Everyone had read the letters and heard the tape. They'd predicted an attack in the city in September or October. Oh, let's have a look. Oh, bonnie baby. <laughs> yeah. Who are these? Are these at university? Yes, this is the very last photograph of her. Barbara decided to go to university in Bradford. Yes. And were you happy that she would be safe there, given that the fear that was around at the time? Yes, we didn't think she'd be doing anything that would take her into danger, well, providing she was sensible. But, but it was a very happy time. For yes, yes, it was really. Because she was at that stage where she was becoming independent. Um, and we were at the stage of entering a new phase of our relationship. It was because of her I had my ears pierced. <laughs> um, things like that. She didn't feel 
unsafe or worried about it. She thought she was in a comparatively safe area, um, enough to go walking round the block at night. We'd, we'd been up to see her, and I can remember waving goodbye to her. Standing, she was standing. Just outside the, um, the against the brick wall, or the, the low wall in front of the house. And that was it. D.I. David Zacherson began looking at the letters again and uncovered worrying links with the case of another of Britain's most notorious murderers. The Victorian serial killer Jack the Ripper, who murdered at least six women in London's East End in the 1880s. Hundreds of hoax letters had been sent in that case too. When I got the photographs of the three letters, they gave me the impression of being a bit old-fashioned in style. When you look at the way it's being written, it could pass almost for a Victorian uh, letter. When I uh, saw how he signed off, yours respectfully, Jack the Ripper, it occurred to me that we had a Yorkshire Ripper, but this is the first time we had a Jack the Ripper. The impression one gets of this guy's mentality is a curious mixture of being really clever, cunning, no fingerprints, nor any identification of where the tape came from. Uh, there would be sort of numbers on the tape, batch numbers and that. He's filed them away. This guy is not altogether stupid by any means. He's, he's a morbid sort of character, isn't he? They're trying to do what he is doing. And I suppose he thinks in a twisted sort of way it's funny. What else did you put on the end of that tape? Oh, there was like a little tune. What tune was that? Uh, Stung you for being a friend. <laughs> Hope you like the catchy tune at the end. The more Zacherson compared the Victorian letters with John Humble's, the more convinced he became of the similarities between them. This writer was using almost the same phraseology. In 1888, that joke about leather apron gave me real fits. And it seemed to me that uh, it was too much of a coincidence. The 1978 letter reads, that photo in the paper gave me fits. A lot of papers carried photo fits of the supposed Yorkshire killer. That photo in the paper, so here he is saying paper, paper means newspaper, then we can see this. A photo fit of the Yorkshire Ripper suspect with the question, is this the face of the Ripper? Well, if we look at it, that bit about killing myself, that bit, what does it mean, that bit? It can only come from a newspaper. And here we've got, kill yourself, Ripper. Zacherson believed the writer was using 1970s newspapers and imitating the 1888 letters to lead police on a wild goose chase. It was almost, it was almost theatrical. It was almost as if the writer was donning a cloak and top hat and Gladstone bag. He was recreating uh, the image of the Ripper stalking uh, the streets of Whitechapel. But it, I'm beginning to lose confidence in these, just a, a shade. Where did you get Jack from? Oh, I read a book in the library. There are some significant similarities in the letters that you wrote 
did you use some of the phrases and some of the knowledge that you picked more, up from the book? Lately, from the books. From the book? Yeah. <coughs> you mentioned briefly yesterday that you may have taken some uh, <coughs> excerpts out of that book and transferred them onto the letters. I will have read, read it thoroughly, like. Right. Did you, ma did you mark in the book any... I just got fascinated by it, you know. Yeah. Did you mark off in the book anywhere where you've taken things out of that book oh, and transferred no. them to the letters? No, no I didn't take them out. So while Humble turned for his inspiration to the past, he couldn't know how his crime would be investigated in the future. In 1981, the forensic samples from his letters and tape were stored. Science at the time couldn't identify him, but 27 years later, DNA technology had brought detectives within reach. West Yorkshire's homicide and major inquiry team reopened the case. With science moving quickly, there are possibly uh, samples of evidence lying in a laboratory that if we ask the scientists to rework, we may get a result even today. What kind of tools have you got at your disposal now that you didn't have 25 years ago? There's a, there's a whole range. I mean, DNA is, is, is the prime tool that uh, is available today that uh, is a fairly recent, over the last 15 or so years, um, innovation. There was a stigma hanging over the force from, uh, from that time. I mean, the Ripper case itself was one of the most major criminal cases of the last century. If we had half a chance of finding this person, we felt a responsibility to do so. We've moved into a position now where we have all the techniques, we have the science, and if we could track down some of the evidence which may have led us to this person, then we felt that we had to try and find that. Stored at the Forensic Science Service Lab were three tiny pieces from the original envelope sent by Humble. The pieces were from the gummed seal and would almost certainly have been licked by the sender of the tape. But could these tiny scraps really be enough to give a DNA profile? They do look tiny. They're, it's actually a gold mine in, in forensic terms. We're used to dealing with a lot smaller samples than these. And so for us, they have a real potential. We did really just have one chance at this. There was going to be no going back, really. The techniques that we use will destroy um, the envelope flap or basically take away all the DNA that we have. We've used a, a sterile swab just to recover the DNA. Then, very simply, we just use a, um, a sterile scalpel to remove the swab head. And this can then be placed in a very small sterile tube. This was going to be the chance that we had to identify Wearside Jack. This was going to be the best evidence that we could get from what we'd retained in our archives. Uh, and therefore, it was a little bit of apprehension, really. Is it actually going to work? This is our one chance. I mean, were you hopeful it was, what, you know, 25 odd years old? I mean, we, we were delighted that we actually found that part of the gum seal uh, laying in a forensic science laboratory. Having found that, we thought there must be a realistically good chance that we'd uh, that you'd be successful. That you get something from it. You never know for sure. You keep your fingers crossed, you hope that things will be successful, but you don't know for sure. The result was sent to the National Police Database holding profiles of criminals convicted since 2001. After 27 years, would the mystery of the hoaxer finally be solved? This is what came back from the National DNA Database, telling us that we have a, a database hit to a man called John Samuel Humble. gives us his date of birth, also that it was sampled by Northumbria. It was almost a bit of a surreal moment after all this time that uh, you suddenly have the answer to, to something that's been hanging over the, the force in this area for, for many, many years, and uh, suddenly you have the, the key to unlock something that's been a mystery for so long.
It doesn't happen very often, um, but when you do get a result like that, it's one that really makes you go quite weak at the knees, I think. John Humble had a long career as a petty criminal. After a conviction for being drunk and disorderly, his DNA had been put on the national database. No good looking for fingerprints. It's clean as a whistle. It's clean as a whistle. Cleaning the tape for fingerprints was enough to avoid being caught in 1979. Humble couldn't know that a quarter of a century later, his DNA would lead straight to him. When they knocked on his door, he, uh, he was there at home uh, with his brother. He was drunk. I don't think he realised much of what was happening at that point. The house he was living in with his brother, it was very sparse. He, in his more recent years, had turned very much to drink at uh, John Humble. His criminal record showed him to be a violent alcoholic, with a hatred of the police dating back to 1975, when he was imprisoned for assaulting a constable. He had gone to school in Castletown, the place the experts had pinpointed. He must have thought it had all gone away and this would never catch up with him. I'm pretty sure. I mean, he must have thought uh, he'd got away with this. And uh, the last thing he would have expected that afternoon or that evening was uh, a knock on the door and bringing him back to, to Wakefield for this. This interview is being tape recorded and it may be given in evidence if this case goes to court. And when we first started interviewing him, we didn't know whether he was going to admit it or not. Could you give me, please, your full name and your date of birth? I can tell you that um, this is John Samuel Humble. I am telling you who he is because Mr Humble has indicated to me he is not going to say anything at this stage. Were you aware of the letters that were being sent, John, in relation to the Ripper inquiry? Shaking your head. Did you see the Yorkshire Ripper inquiry on television? You're shaking your head. And in the first interview, he, he didn't open his mouth. He said nothing. But he answered almost every question, either by a nod of his head or a shake of his head. So when you said, did you write the letters, what, he nodded his he, head? No, he shook his head. Oh, he shook his head, so he denied it. He denied it. In the first interview, he denied it by shaking his head. Have you sent these letters, John? Shaking your head. And we thought then, is, is, is he being crafty here by not wanting to put his voice on tape? So it couldn't be compared to his voice so on the original be, tape? So it couldn't be compared, yes, to the, uh, to the original tape that we had of, of the Ripper Hoaxer. Tell me in detail, please, everything that you know about those letters, and tell me in detail now, please, so that we can sort this out. Shaking your head. You need to think about this, John, and think about the forensic lines of inquiry. You know how important it is. We'll uh, switch the tapes off, and the interview is uh, concluded. In his cell that night, Humble knew the following morning he'd be asked why his DNA was on the Ripper tape envelope. He decided to break his silence. Send the tape. got my voice on. I regret it, like, especially the last as who died. And did, did anybody else know anything? No, no. Have you told anybody else? No. Why not? Should they shouldn't be. Why didn't you tell anybody else? That. Well, I might have crossed us up. What I mean, do you mean by that? I was a reward, I wouldn't I? Back in August 1979, police had interviewed hundreds of men in Castletown. But as days turned into weeks, experts questioned why the sender of the tape hadn't been found. So at one point, when they were bringing me samples for comparison, almost every time they brought a sample, they'd bring me another a hoax. Piece, uh, a hoax. Another hoax, yeah. Well, a sample of a caller. Yeah, yes, another right, hoax. Yeah. Mm. Might be an Irishman who was <laughs> calling the whole yeah. Daily Mail, I remember. Oh, I'm going to do another one tonight. <laughs> and the police would bring it and say, yeah. is this the voice that you heard? Yeah. <laughs> I began to doubt the police's ability yeah. to distinguish between one yeah. very much contrasting yeah, voice and, yeah, the, yeah. and the original hoaxer, yeah, as yeah. it were. We kept an open mind for, for two or three weeks, at least, didn't we? we? did. And yeah. then we both totally 
And we clicked one moment and we said, there's no way this can be anything but a hoax, we said. Yeah. Otherwise, they'd have got him by now. But of course they were walking past people who couldn't have committed murders, which is ridiculous. Because yeah. if they'd eliminated this speaker early on, then they could have concentrated the, uh, the investigation on what they really needed to do. But they didn't. They wouldn't listen to us. No. They asked our advice and then ignored it. The hoax letters claimed that a woman called Joan Harrison had been murdered by the Ripper and the police had overlooked it. She was killed in 1975 in Preston. In fact, senior detectives had investigated whether she was a victim of the Ripper, but believed that connection had never been made public. Up to number eight now. You say seven, but remember Preston 75. This was one of the main planks of their argument that these communications were from the killer because they were convinced that the Preston murder had never publicly been linked with the Ripper series. Unfortunately, if we look at the Daily Mirror, Tuesday, April the 12th, 77, we see quite a comprehensive account of the Preston connection. The belief that Preston had not been made public is blown apart by this article which is even headed the Preston Connection. In this letter, John, it reads, up to eight now, you say seven, but remember Preston, 75. What did you mean when you wrote that? I just read about that uh, Preston murder. I didn't do it. OK. That's what it mean. No, go on, you tell me what you know about it, or what, what well, it Well, I just read. got out of the paper. Like everything out the paper. Which papers were you getting in 1978? Usually the mirror. What was the purpose of it, John? Do you know? Because I thought he might have done it. You know, because he was gone about killing everybody, wasn't he? I thought so clip might have done it. All the information in the hoax letters had been gathered from newspapers and books and one of the Ripper's victims was never mentioned. Yvonne Pearson was killed in Bradford just before the first letter arrived. Her body was discovered weeks later. He had the ace. He could have played that ace. You haven't even found a victim who I killed in January of this year. Look in such and such a place. That was it. That's all he had to say. He hadn't got to make wild predictions. He hadn't got to keep referring to newspaper articles. He hadn't got to borrow from uh, Ripper books. I'm not quite sure when I strike again. But it will be definitely sometime this year. Maybe September, October. The police focus on the Northeast was diverting crucial resources from Yorkshire. Just two days into September, Peter Sutcliffe fulfilled the predictions in the letters and on the tape. His victim was 21-year-old student Barbara Leach. She'd stayed in Bradford for the weekend rather than travelling home. The telephone went and it was Bradford Police um, asking, was Barbara at home? We said, oh no, she's coming on Monday. And uh, then he explained that she'd been reported missing by her friends. What was going oh, through your mind then? That she was being held somewhere. And I thought, oh, she wouldn't have her glasses with her. She wouldn't be able to see where she was or all sorts of things. That she wouldn't be able to escape, that she wanted me. And I couldn't get to her. So it was almost a relief when they said a body had been found. By late tonight, over a hundred officers have been called in to help with what has now become a major murder inquiry. The 
office pathologist who's examined all the Ripper's victims, Professor David G, is now at the scene carrying out a post-mortem. Police called that night. Knock at the door, and they said we've found a body. We'd like you to come up to Bradford. So we travelled up in the police car, and David went in to identify her. You didn't, in the you morgue. didn't want to do that. I was terrified because, I mean, they called him the Yorkshire Ripper. Imagination, you can imagine. I was going running riot. I couldn't ask my husband, and I couldn't speak of it to anyone. And eventually, I, I got my friend. I said. Would you ask David? Was she badly hurt? And no, she got scratches on her face, but it, it was mainly in her body that I, I don't know why I didn't want to face. I'm not quite sure when I strike again. The tape had predicted the next murder would be in September. Maybe September, October. The letters had said the next murder would be in Bradford. Was Barbara's murder conclusive evidence that the letter writer was genuine? That, uh lent huge credibility to it. Here he was carrying out his threat. There was another possibility, of course. The killer himself would have heard the tape. He would perhaps have read extracts of the letter, the published letter, and he might well have decided that if he were to kill somebody in September or October, in Bradford's Manningham, that that would be an even greater distraction. Barbara Leach's murder in Yorkshire provoked furious debate about the connection to the Northeast, but the inquiry continued to focus on Sunderland. A secret document was released to every police force in the land. Crucially, it ruled out from the inquiry any suspects who didn't have a Geordie accent. Well, that meant only one thing, that we were now being driven down the path of the man from Sunderland and the killer being synonymous. We were gassed to think that they would eliminate our, 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 on an accent because we, th there was not the slightest reason, in our opinion, that the guy should have a Geordie accent. One of my comments was, I'll tell you where he comes from, but I'm not going to tell you that he's a murderer. John Humble couldn't know about the secret document, but he did know that while police were looking for him, the Ripper had killed Barbara Leach. Finally, his guilt got the better of him. I did phone in, you know. Tell me about that then, go on. And I said, here, take any notice it's a hoax. But they didn't seem to be bothered. This is the first time that phone call has ever been broadcast. Repeat that, I can't hear you, it's a bad line. Um, it's a fake. What's a fake? What one is this? The one that he's just received? The Ripper. 
How do you know that? Just tell him. Just tell him. The one in June. Pardon? The one in June. And why did you decide it was time to phone in, John? Because I felt guilty. Why? Because that last one of the lasses was murdered. And I blame myself for it. That's why I phoned in. They took me in the office and another two got killed. I'm sorry, it's a bad it's a bad line, you're gonna have to repeat it. Let it be said that the majority of people that in the Sunderland incident room felt that that caller, when listening to the tape recording, was the same as the person who had made the tape in June. There was nothing stopping you, John, from picking up the phone and saying, my name is John Humble. Come and see me at my address. I've made this tape. Oh, I wasn't going to give me cell away. I just said, let them know it was a hoax. So before that, you were quite happy to go along with this hoax, were you? But not after, I, not, not after I sent a tip, because it was, it was getting on my nerves. It was on the bloody telly all the time. Even if you do get near, I'd probably top myself first. Haunted by his own voice played across the nation, Humble became severely depressed. Soon after making the call, he tried to kill himself by jumping off the Weirmouth Bridge. Well, it's been nice chatting to you, George. It was a failed suicide attempt. He, he was pulled from the river by uh, two police officers, and I think he was hospitalised for, for quite a number of weeks following that. How ironic. So two police officers pulled him out of the river, not knowing? No. That uh, they were pulling the, out the the Ripper hoaxer, the guy who you know was uh, behind this major hoax at the time. Voice experts Jack and Stanley knew nothing of Humble's phone call, but by now they were convinced the letters and tapes were a hoax. They decided to put their doubts in writing. We'd already spoken to them saying these things, but we decided that we would both put it down in writing. That one weekend, Stanley wrote a letter, and straight after that, the next day, I wrote another independent letter saying exactly what we thought and that we agreed that we didn't think it could be anything but a hoaxer. And it was at that stage I thought, this has to be put down in the form of a report. There's no point going round um, <laughs> verbally expressing doubts. There needs to be a record. But what they did with us is persuaded us for over a year, didn't they, Stanley? Not to break ranks, not to, not to reveal publicly what we were, had been telling them. Well, that really wasn't a good idea. West Yorkshire's chief constable, Ronald Gregory, was under mounting pressure. I make no apology for... The failure to catch the Ripper was becoming a national scandal. Despite the misgivings about the Sunderland connection, he launched Project R, the first ever advertising campaign to catch a serial killer. Over the past four years, 12 women have been horribly murdered and mutilated by a sick, sadistic maniac, the Yorkshire Ripper. How can we stop this madman from killing again? Here's one way. Listen. I'm not quite sure when I start again. The public now thought the Ripper could only be a Geordie. But the woman who survived an attack by him was still sure he was from Yorkshire. The tape was brought to her home. My mum got a phone call from George Oldfield, wanting to come and see me to listen to a tape of a Geordie, Geordie man. I listened to the tape and um, he said to me, does it sound like this guy that attacked you? <clears throat> I said no, because it wasn't a Geordie. Geordie guy, you know, it's definitely Yorkshire. And he, and he kept saying, are you sure it wasn't Geordie? I said, yes, I'm sure. I know who I spoke to for those 30 minutes. I said, you know, obviously his voice is imprinted in my, in my mind. And, um, and I just said that um, there's no doubt in my mind that it's not, not a Geordie guy. It was a, a Yorkshire man. Definitely, no doubt. Well, it's been nice chatting to you, George. Yours, chat the river. What effect do you think this tape had? I don't know. I don't know. I shouldn't have done it, like, 
No, I don't. Why shouldn't you have done it, John? Because it's evil. Why is it evil, John? Well, it sounds evil anyway, doesn't it? It certainly sounds evil, but why is it evil? I don't know. It just sounds it. Well, it's evil because it diverted the police into the northeast, John. That's the reason, isn't it? Oh, I did, like. I didn't realise at the time. I didn't cotton on. I forgot about the axe being a Geordie. I should have cottoned on to that. You should. As the search in Sunderland continued, so did Peter Sutcliffe's killing spree. Marguerite Walls, a 47-year-old civil servant, was murdered on the 20th of August, 1980, as she walked home from work in Farsley, near Leeds. Humble's hoax was having a devastating effect on the police inquiry. The real Ripper was being ignored because he didn't have the right accent or writing. This report has never been seen before, but it shows that Sutcliffe had been mentioned as a suspect on nine separate occasions. The detective who wrote it didn't pursue him, though. He just passed the report up to a senior officer. Uh, Laptude's report came in along with a great pile of others. Uh, we did enormous pile every day, and I read it and uh, uh, saw that he'd been eliminated on handwriting and um, accent, and therefore I marked it file. This was before computers were introduced into police work and it was all manually done. The systems that we had at the time were fine for dealing with an isolated murder. But this series of murders just ground it to a halt. I mean, it was impossible for the people who were trying to handle this in the incident rooms to piece it all together. I mean, give us an idea how much paperwork was there? Well, an example being the, the incident room at Milgarth, which was the hub of this investigation, had to have the floors reinforced to, to hold the paper. The to weight, hold the of, weight the, of the paper? The weight of the paper in the incident room was actually putting too much strain on the floor. Here, at a secret police warehouse, just some of that paperwork left over from the Ripper investigation. And just get stored away for years and years, it can be until... And do they get, do they get revisited much, the boxes here? No, they don't. Not unless a case goes to appeal or something like that. So everything that's in these three sets of files here is what's left of the Ripper inquiry? It is, and this is literally a fraction of what existed in the original inquiry. And, uh, for example, in these boxes here. Yeah, what have we got in, here? Well, the card index boxes. These are the original wooden trays that were in the incident rooms. Can we open this? There's about 3,500 cards in each, of the, um, in each of the trays, and nearly half a million in total are stored here. Half a half million? A million. So with each new murder, did all the names get added into this card file system? Well, no, they didn't. With each new murder, it started a new system. So each one was stacking on top of each other. So the cross-referencing became absolutely, you know, as well, impossible. Difficult. How much of the stuff in the boxes here would be police work generated by John Humble, by his hoaxes, by the false leads that he gave you? An awful lot. There'll be a lot of documentation and work in here that was generated as a result of the letters and tape he sent. On the 17th of November, 1980, Sutcliffe killed for the last time. Jacqueline Hill was murdered as she walked home. She was a third-year student at Leeds University. This series of killings has gone on now for the past five years. He has caused enough grief and anguish. He's obviously very sick, much more sick than he realises. It's in his interest now that he gets treatment and that he comes forward. Six weeks later, and five years after he began killing, Peter Sutcliffe was finally arrested. It was a piece of routine police work by two officers that led to Sutcliffe's arrest in Sheffield last Friday night. Sutcliffe was arrested for having false number plates. Inside his car was a prostitute. She was intended for his next victim. As Sutcliffe arrived in a police van, the crowd... As he was questioned, Sutcliffe confessed to being the Yorkshire Ripper bringing to an end the biggest manhunt in British criminal history. 
And I can tell you that we are absolutely delighted with developments at this stage. Absolutely delighted. Can you, can you, can you all smile? Really delighted. Is it fair then to say that the general hunt for the so-called Yorkshire Ripper is now being wound down? But from this moment on... Right. They uh, interviewed Gregory and the, one of the reporters said, did he have a Geordie accent? And Gregory stonewalled. He simply said... I cannot tell you that because I've not heard him speak. Can you give us any... It's laughable. I mean, as if he didn't, wouldn't know a thing like that immediately. It was quite clear that we'd been on the wrong horse with regard to the accent. Peter Sutcliffe's accent was unmistakably Yorkshire, not Geordie. Then said David, is there a question you want to ask? And I said, there is. Does he have a northeast accent? And he said no. And I felt as though a massive burden had been lifted from my shoulders. Over five years of terror, Sutcliffe had murdered 13 women and attacked eight others. Three were murdered and three attacked during Humble's hoax. Sutcliffe told police the hoax was a diversion which helped him carry on. Why did you send that to the Daily Mirror, John? Publicity. What kind of publicity? Notoriety. For who? For me. On March the 20th, 2006, Humble was sentenced to eight years in prison. And police finally put a face to that voice. I'm Jack. I say you are still having no luck catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George, but Lord, you are no near catching me now than four years ago when I started. I reckon your boys are letting you down, George. You can't be much good, can you? Without his hoax, there would have been far stronger policing of the Yorkshire area where Sutcliffe was. He'd been through their hands quite a few times, Sutcliffe this is, and each time they'd eliminated him because of something that the hoaxer had said. I'm not quite sure when I'll strike again. Definitely sometime this year. Maybe September or October. Even sooner if I get the chance. Yes, Barbara might have been alive if... John Humble hadn't hoaxed the police. I might have had grandchildren. Might have had a daughter too. Yes, no. Won't happen. See you soon. Bye. Hope you like the catchy tune at the end. Uh -huh. 17 years after an horrific crime, DNA proves his downfall. Strong language now on BBC One as a rapist faces the day of reckoning.